Hi there and welcome to Biostatistics. So I'm Jonathan Marshall, I'm an Associate Professor in Statistics and you can find me in SCB317, so that's in Social Science Tower B. Um, I'm not there very often, so um, particularly at, at, at the moment, um, so please um, drop me an email first. So, um, uh, so I'm a statistician, as I said, I have two pets, so this is Minnie, Golden Retriever obviously, and uh, she's about seven, and um, Chili, who is... Um, about 16 uh, and this is uh, my son Sam who is now four and I'm interested in, in the statistical modeling of disease so for example two areas spatiotemporal modeling and source attribution so uh, as an example for spatiotemporal modeling I did some modeling work uh, for the Ministry of Health before Christmas looking at uh, coronavirus in Auckland uh, during the sort of the tail end of the D Delta outbreak and the idea there was that um, that um, towards the end of the outbreak there um, the cases that we were still having was were mostly driven by the by the characteristics of the of the regions um, or the people in those regions rather than um, all being driven by the fact that it's just come in and there's lots and lots of per person to person spread. So, for example, things like um, you know vaccination rates, right? So the cases were in areas with, with lower vaccination rates. Cases were in areas where where there was lower access to healthcare. Cases were in areas where there were larger household sizes. Right, that sort of thing. And so we fit a model of cases in terms of things like the number of cases in previous um, previous weeks and the number of cases in the area around the area that you're looking in and so on in terms of all of those um, other things that we can measure like vaccination rates and so on. And we can use that then to predict where potential hotspots are in places where we currently don't have coronavirus. So if there was an outbreak started somewhere else, um, which areas are the ones that are, are really going to take off or at least we think are going to um, have more cases and it's really just building on common sense really right we you know we, we know that um, that you're going to have more cases where the vaccination rates are lower we know we're going to have more cases where access to health care and testing is lower we know we're going to have more cases where the household size is higher we know we're going to have more cases where the um, perhaps the demographics the population uh, sizes are going to um, skewed to, towards younger people because younger people were less vaccinated right so we know this but we don't know how they all sort of interact that's what the modeling was was for to tell us how they interact so what we're going to cover today is essentially what is statistics so statistics is basically quantifying evidence um, we're going to have a look at a little bit about um, how we get data um, how we can summarize data essentially by looking at some examples so statistics allows us to quantify evidence, and what I mean by that is we, essentially it allows us to, um, to quantify the unknown. So we can measure things quite easily with rulers and scales and microbiology counting stuff, right? Um, and so we can find um, out a lot about our world just by measuring things, but we can never measure everything, right? So there's always things that we can't measure just because it would overwhelm us to try and do everything. So for example, um, you know, if we want to measure something on cows in the country of New Zealand, there's about 6 million of them, right? Now they are all listed in a database, or in theory they are, uh, all listed in, in, in a database. So we could randomly pick cows from the, from the country just by going down, down that database and picking, you know, a, a thousand rows or something. Um, but it's impractical to do that because we'd have to go all over the country to try and measure those random cows. But if we could do that, then the unknown, the thing that we haven't measured, is because we've only measured a random subset. And if the thing that we're measuring is different to the population just due to randomness, then statistics allows us to quantify the amount of uncertainty that we will have. So we can measure the thing, and then we can also measure how much we think we're going to be wrong, or how much out we're going to be, how much stuff we don't know. But it can only, statistics can only account for the uncertainty in the case that things are random. Okay. Now most of the time when we have data, it's not all random. So some of it will be, perhaps, particularly if you've done an experimental trial or something, right? You do a trial, you have a control group and you have a treatment group, and you randomise things to each of those groups, right? You randomise animals to each group or people to each group or whatever. And because of that randomness, the difference between the groups should hopefully just be due to random chance. Right, so that the when you then apply the treatment, the main difference between the groups of the treatment is that one one got the treatment and one got the control. Right, but there'll be still other things to do with that um, 
data collection process that perhaps aren't random. So there'll be biases introduced because of the way we undertake things. Okay, And statistics only allows us to quantify the purely random bit. It doesn't allow us to quantify the, the bit that's not random. Um, so essentially it allows us to uh, characterize the bias due to randomness, uh, sorry, the uncertainty due to randomness, but it doesn't allow us to control the sort of the systematic bias, um, which is not a random process. So typically a question you want to ask when using data will concern some population. And so the easiest way to really answer that is just to measure everything um, in the population, right? Um, and if you can do that, then of course it's the best way to answer it because then you know the answer. Um, that's of course a census. Um, every five years in New Zealand we do a census in order to understand uh, the population of New Zealand people. Um, and the census tends to have fairly high coverage in that you, you uh, certainly of some subgroups, you, you essentially cover everyone in the population. Um, but it is of course extremely expensive to do so. Uh, which is why we only run them every five years. Um, a cheaper and much more convenient way is just to measure some people, right? So some of the population that you're interested in, um, a sample of them, and then somehow infer from the sample about um, the population. Uh, and that's what's usually done, because in some cases it's either not possible at all to measure everyone, um, or it's not practical from a, um, from a uh, financial point of view. Or from a time point of view. But of course whenever you have a sample instead of a population uh, you don't have complete information right you um, you only have a subset of the population uh, of interest. And statistics is essentially the process that allows us or inferential statistics is the process that allows us to go from that sample to the population um, and we do so basically by essentially embracing the fact that we don't know everything, embracing the uncertainty. Um, and we can do a little bit more than that, in fact, um, in, in some circumstances, depending on how the, sample, the sampling has been done, um, if, it's, if it's a random sample in some way, then we can in fact characterise the extent of the uncertainty that we would expect to have, just because we know quite a lot about how things happen um, due to random chance. But when we do that, the choice of the sample is extremely important as, um, as the sample really has to uh, differ only from the population only in either ways that we can understand and characterise or uh, through randomness, right? Uh, so that it's a pure random um, subsample. Um, and unfortunately, collecting a pure random sample is, is difficult or impossible um, just like collecting the entire population is impossible. So often this is difficult and so we need to be able, we'll need to be able to characterize how, um, how, how much different our sample might be from the population and if it's too different then statistics will be able to tell you about how um, the amount of uncertainty that we have um, from our sample due to the sampling process, due to the randomness, but it won't be able to tell you anything at all um, if your sample is in fact non-random. So the ideal sample is a simple random one where essentially we label everyone in the population and then use a random number generator to pick which one's the sample. Um, but if you imagine doing that in New Zealand, we'd give everyone a, a number, if you like, of New Zealanders from one to uh, five million odd in New Zealand currently. Um, and then we could use a random number generator to pick out, say, a thousand of them to go and have a talk to. Then those thousand people are going to be scattered all over the country and going to, to talk to them might be um, quite difficult uh, from a practical point of, point of view. So generally we take shortcuts, okay? And whenever we take a shortcut, then our, our sample's likely to be non-representative in some way, uh, which is okay as long as we know how it is not representative, okay? So um, in some cases we can fix an unrepresented sample, and this is done um, very often, um, in many, uh, both scientific studies, but plus in things like um, a scientific polling of, of people for their views, for example, political views or whatever. Um, if we're polling for political views, then um, we could use the electoral roll, which is the, the list of everyone that uh, is eligible to vote in New Zealand, 
um, and we could um, take a random sample of them. But unfortunately, the electoral roll only holds their, uh, the, the person's address at the last election. So we'd have to, um, you know, somehow from their address at the last election, find out how to get in contact with them in order to, you know, do a proper simple random poll. So instead, we take shortcuts, right? We, um, we might use a uh, random uh, dialing of, of um, phones uh, or mobile phones, for example. Okay, so just randomly dial mobile phones in New Zealand, maybe get a thousand of them, and ask the person who picks up, um, you know, how they're intending to vote at the next election, or, you know, do you like red versus blue or whatever, right? Um, but when we do that, we know, of course, that these are not going to be representative because we know that the dis distribution of the method that we're using to contact people, the distribution of landlines or of mobile phones or whatever it might be that we're using, is not uniform is not the same as the distribution of uh, voters, eligible voters that are actually going to turn up and vote. For example, um, if we were only using landlines, then young people just don't have them. My guess is that the people listening to this lecture probably don't have a landline. I don't have a landline, right? So if they were using that method to get in contact with us, they're not going to contact me and they're not gonna, probably not going to contact you either. But maybe that's not actually too bad because, um, you know, you guys are generally, you people are generally young and, of course, young people tend to not vote as much as old people, so maybe it all kind of cancels out. But there's lots of other criteria, right? So certain other demographics don't vote as much either. So, for example, different ethnicities vote uh, with a different proportion uh, than other ethnicities. Um, different ages voted a different proportion. Um, people in different uh, socioeconomic uh, conditions vote at different rates and so on. So ideally what we want is we want a sample that accounts for the differences um, between uh, the people that we can talk to, people that are going to end up in our sample, and in fact the population of interest. And as long as we have um, some idea as to what uh, the people that, that we want to talk to should look like, we know how they actually look like because we talk to them. And as long as we know the difference between them, we can weight them um, differently. So, for example, if we were um, you know, just using landlines to try and contact people that are going to vote, then we know that, that young people are unlikely to end up in our sample and old people are more likely to end up in our sample. And so when we get young people in our sample, we're going to count them more. Maybe every young person will maybe count four times. All right, so they'll essentially will, will replicate their result four times in order to sort of cancel out the fact that we're not, um, we're unlikely to get enough young people in the sample. And maybe we'll discount some of the older people we get in the sample because we know that they're overrepresentative. Alternatively, we could sample by strata. So we could, you know, if we know the, the distribution uh, that we want, we know perhaps um, the, the, um, the gender split that we want and the age split that we want and the... Um, ethnicity split that we want, then we can sample until we get the age distribution or gender distribution or ethnicity distribution that we that we want. That's another way to do it. Um, whenever we do this, whenever we try and fudge things, then there's usually a, a problem with doing so in that that increases the amount of uncertainty that um, uh, that'll be associated with that poll. Okay, so for example, when um, in political polls in New Zealand, um, they are reweighted in order to try and get them uh, more accurate. Um, by doing so, they are more they 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 tend to be accurate on average. Obviously, that's the whole po point of a political poll. But the amount of uncertainty associated with that political poll is more than the uncertainty that you'd expect to be associated with the political poll, given the sample size. Okay, so for example, with a sample of size a thousand, you would expect to be able to um, to uh, get, say, the Labour Party within plus or minus 3% or so in terms of the proportion of people wanting to vote for that, uh, for that particular uh, party. But in fact, um, because of the way that the poll is done and the fact that we have to re-weight people, um, in actual fact, in actual practice in New Zealand polling, it's actually plus or minus 6%. So it's about double the uncertainty. Okay, So that's just something to think about um, if in an election year, for example. Right? When you see um, you know, polls changing through time, are they actually changing plus or minus 6% from poll to poll? If not, it's 
nothing to be worried about. It's probably just um, sample to sample variation. So the overall um, idea is that we want to sample purely randomly because that's really the only no thing we know how to deal with. Um, that's the only thing that we know how to accurately quantify the uncertainty. Uh, but often that's not possible, so we can kind of fudge it in order to to um, to make it work. But that's just going to increase the amount of uncertainty. It sort of makes sense, right? If you fudge it, then you're going to um, you're going to end up with a little bit more uncertainty. Now, when we do a study, um, there's two main types of studies that we can use. The first um, is observational studies, which is where we collect data um, without an intervention, so we just observe the world and and note down what we see. And the second are, of course, experimental studies where we interfere with the, with the world and uh, we set it up so that, um, so that we can assess whether our interference uh, changed things or not. Okay? Um, with experimental studies, um, essentially what we do is we randomly allocate um, units to groups and we mess with one or more of the groups and we don't mess with another in order to assess whether the, uh, the intervention that we put in place um, affected the groups differently or not. Um, and experimental studies are really what you want to do when, when you want to uh, infer uh, causation. So for example, um, the ex experimental studies are what they would have used um, to determine whether the COVID vaccines were, were, were uh, useful or not. They would have given um, a bunch of people um, uh, the vaccine and a bunch of people not the vaccine, uh, you know, so, uh, some placebo, and then uh, assessed um, how well they how well things did, what the response to the um, to the challenge uh, uh, by the virus was. Uh, with observational studies, it's hard to, to infer causation. Um, the reason is all we're doing is we're observing things, so um, we don't know what has changed between the two groups that we're doing. So for example, it's hard to assess the effect of smoking in people. Does smoking cause lung cancer, for example? It's hard to assess because the only thing you can really do is observe things through time. You can't do an experiment, right? You can't say to people um, at birth, essentially, hey, you're going to be a smoker and you're not, and then uh, sort of at random, and then assess how they do over time, right? To assess the proportion of um, the, the smokers that end up with lung cancer and the pro proportion of the non-smokers that end up with lung cancer. Instead, we're going to investigate it through uh, observing what happens, which generally takes uh, a lot longer, uh, so you need many studies done over time, and a bunch of other criteria in order for causation to occur. For example, um, you want the lung cancer to happen after the person started smoking and so on. Um, in either case, we can do statistics, um, but perhaps um, the way we... we, um, we interpret the statistics is going to is going to differ a little bit right so if you've got an experimental study then any difference you see between the treatment and the control group is probably due to your intervention because that should be the only difference between the groups because the groups have been allocated at random right so the random allocation essentially averages out the differences between the groups at the start to be zero so that when you see a difference it's probably due to the intervention um, it's a little bit harder with observational studies. You'll get the same sort of statistics, but of course your argument as to, um, as to whether there's an effect of something or not um, may also be driven by differences in the, in, in the groups that you haven't accounted for in your study. Now statistics just tells you essentially the magnitude of the effect and perhaps it will also give you some measure of how uncertain you are about it, but it doesn't explain the effect at all. Okay, so um, statistics is really just a tiny small part of the overall puzzle and the, the why or the, um, you know, uh, what is the consequences of this is really um, a, a different field of study and the different field of study will depend on where the program came up but um, you, you look at that in a, in a lot more detail when you do epidemiology. So I was saying before that observational studies um, are hard to, to um, infer causation and there's been lots of observational studies done, for example, for the risk of uh, different food types on cancer. Um, this figure summarises um, some of those studies, not all of them, it's a little bit um, out of date now. Um, but each dot here represents a, a different uh, published study, so published in the scientific literature and peer-reviewed. And um, the placement of the dot um, is in respect to the to the relative risk for cancer. 
Right, so if it's past, if it's greater than one, then it's um, then it's a risk for cancer, and if it's less than one, then it's protective against cancer. And you can see that um, with all these different food groups, lots of different studies have been done, and you can see that um, many of them are actually very inconsistent. So, for example, wine is both preventative in some studies, and uh, a risk for cancer in others. So are tomatoes, so is tea, so is sugar, although it tends to be more of a risk than not, there's only one study that says it's not. Um, onion um, is apparently good for you, except the one study that says it's not, and so on. Um, most of these things are, in fact, have uh, two directions to them, except perhaps this one down the bottom here, uh, bacon, which unfortunately is always risky. Um, sort of another note from this, um, this is sort of one of the problems um, with observational studies, of course, is that um, you know, a single observational study um, will get a different result and even a different direction of effects. Um, and that may be due to many different things. It may not be that, that it's a, you know, bit of a stink study. It might just be that they controlled for different things. Um, it might be that they were analysing different populations. Um, there might be lots of different um, variables for which the groups differed under these different studies and thus the different results that you might get. So some of this will just be random fluctuation around a true effect, but the vast majority of it will probably be just different setups in the studies. Okay, so how do we go about summarising data? Well, before we summarise data, we kind of need to know um, what we're going to do based on the type of data that it is. There's generally two types of data. Um, there's data that are a bunch of numbers, um, which is measurement data, um, we call that numerical quantitative data, and um, when we have a measurement data then we're, what we're interested in really is what the sort of the average value of that measurement might be, and perhaps the spread of it, and maybe the, a little bit of the shape of the distribution. So the key is you're interested in distributions of measurements, okay? Uh, so where is the where is the kind of the most common value, the typical value for the for the variable of measure, and perhaps how much spread there is and things like that. Uh, the other type of data is categorical data or grouping data, um, and these typically have a small number of categories or levels. Um, they could be ordered or they could not be. It probably doesn't matter too much in in how you analyze it. It may matter in how you display it on a graph. If the data are ordered, then it pays to put it on the graph in order. Um, and what's of interest here is really the counts or proportions of each category. Right? If you've got some something that's like, like low, medium and high, for example, you want to know what proportion are high compared to what proportion are low. So you use things like tables or bar charts for this. Okay, so two main data types, numeric and categorical. We're going to start with numeric, um, but we'll see some category ones as well. Um, and the idea with both really is that when we're summarising it, t typically a picture will be better than words. Um, particularly for, um, uh, for continuous data, a picture shows you the distribution. So it doesn't just show you where the centre is, which for example writing down what the mean or the median is would tell you. Um, instead it tells you about the, where the centre is and the spread and the shape all at the same time. Okay. Um, when we summarise data, essentially what we're trying to do is show as much information as we can, um, but perhaps not too much. So we want to show the data values themselves if we can, or summaries that, um, that don't misrepresent the data. Um, and as part of that, we don't plot incomplete summaries. So in some fields in science, for example, often you'll see um, bars representing a mean, and with some... Um, like in a bar chart, and you end up with some standard errors um, around the around the bars. Now the problem with that is that the standard error is an uncertainty in the mean, but it doesn't tell you anything about the variation of the data. So whenever you um, essentially replace the data with a mean, you've stripped out all of the variability of the data around the mean. And the variability of the data around the mean is one of the key things that you look at in order to determine, for example, if there's differences between groups and things like that. Um, one thing that's useful to do and that, um, that our studio makes it easy to do with the ggplot library that we'll use is um, this last one here, to split the data into repeated small plots. 
um, when it when it helps you to do so. Okay, so this is particularly important when you're looking at the distribution of a variable or the relationship between two variables, and you want to see if that relationship differs depending on some other grouping variable, for example. So you essentially want to do the same plot but within subgroups. And that can be really informative for helping to tell the story about how the relationship between the variables that you're interested in changes based on some, some other criteria. So general considerations when um, making a plot is make sure that it's as self-contained as you can get it. Um, ideally you won't need um, additional um, figure captions or anything like that in order to explain what's going on. You should be able to infer it from the figure axes, from the legends, perhaps from the title. So that means choosing good labels for axes and make sure that, the, that it's um, clear what the variable of interest is and perhaps what the unit is. Uh, choose a good title. You can use the title to help tell the story. Okay, so don't use a title such as, you know, distribution of the uh, of hand span in millimeters or something, because that's kind of useless information when you've got a histogram in front of you with hand span in millimeters on the x-axis. Right? You can immediately see that you've got the distribution of hand spans on the x-axis because that's what I see in front of me. Adding a title that says the same thing is of no use to me. Instead, you could say something like, hand spans tend to be 23 centimeters or something like that, which is help, helps provide information that's not in immediately obvious perhaps from the plot. Um, obviously, uh, make sure your legends are appropriate. So if you're using um, color or uh, symbols to, um, to denote different groups, then make sure you've got a legend that, that does that. Uh, that has that uh, set up and is clear. Um, ggplot makes this automatic, you don't have to worry about it too much, although you may have to worry about renaming things. And um, make sure you don't have too much noise on the plot, so too much background lines and stuff to, um, to get in the way of the data. Okay, and sometimes the data itself can be the noise. So there's situations where you may need to um, push the data into the background a little bit, perhaps by by making it a little bit see-through or something, particularly when you're um, when you're presenting data summaries on top of actual data. We might see some uh, examples of that later on, definitely when we do modeling. And the other thing is, is just to use a consistent theme in, uh, um, in terms of the colors that you use, the fonts that you use, the size that you use, and so on, um, for more than one plot. So use the same colors um, for the same things over and over if you are constructing a story through multiple plots. And again, ggplot makes this easy because it defaults to the same colors anyway. And whenever you change them, you tend to uh, change them in the same way. So we're going to start by describing um, um, a uh, some numeric data. We'll see that in a moment. And we do that typically by describing um, the distribution of the data. And so the distribution of the data is typically described by where the center is, where the typical value is, um, how much uh, spread there is around that value, so what the range of the data is, what the smallest value, the largest value are, and also a little bit about shape, right? So is there a, is there um, is there kind of a skewness? Is there a asymmetry, um, or does it look somewhat symmetric? That's the type of thing that we describe for um, when when describing this, the uh, the shape of a numeric measure. For a categorical measure, on the other hand, basically you're looking at the proportions or the counts. Right, so you're saying how are those proportions or counts distributed across the various categories that you have. Um, whenever you have groups involved, then essentially you're describing those same things, but you're comparing them across the groups. And a key thing to do when describing data, particularly when writing about what you see in a plot, is that magnitude is what matters. So small changes um, may not be important, so don't focus on them. Right? It's really easy, we'll see it um, later on, particularly when we look at box plots, um, it's really easy for um, students to get fixated about you know, essentially small changes and to report on small changes when small changes just may be a result of the fact that the data are quite small and if you've got a different sample, your sort of direction of any effect that you're seeing is, you know, might be completely different, it might be the opposite to what you see in the sample that you have now. So small changes aren't important just gloss over them. What I try and do is kind of squint a little bit at the picture, and if I can't see anything, it's not worth writing about, okay? 
basically write about the obvious stuff and um, don't worry about the stuff that is not obviously different between the groups. Okay, so some examples. So this is a study that was taken out, undertaken by a second year vet student uh, a few years ago now, um, over the summer. It was looking into uh, lameness in broiler chickens and whether or not an analgesic would be useful at improving the well-being of the chicken. And so this is an important um, issue, both in terms of a, an animal welfare uh, perspective. We want um, chickens to be happy, um, but also in terms of you know productivity or you know uh, business bottom line. And that um, you know if the chicken's lame, then it doesn't put on as much weight, and therefore it's not as um, not as useful to, to the farmer in terms of generating a profit. And so there was an experiment um, looked at um, to see whether we could assess whether an analgesic um, made a difference in terms of lameness. And so we had this uh, a pressure plate and each chicken walked across the plate multiple times uh, in two separate sessions prior to the treatment. Okay, so, um, so we had sessions A and B where we just had the chicken walk across the plate before the treatment. Then some of the um, some of the groups were given um, so the chickens were then given an analgesic and walked across the plate again in another session multiple times in order to, uh, and uh, so that we could see whether the analgesic made any effect. So the pressure plate allows us to collect a bunch of different parameters such as the the width of the step, the length of the step, um, the stance, so kind of um, how wide they are apart and also um, the time it takes to, um, for the chicken to, to um, you know, go left, right, left, stride time. And the primary question of interest is, did the application of analgesic alter how the chickens walked, right? So are the session C results, that's the post-analgesic results, are they different to sessions A and B? Okay, and you could imagine um, with this experimental setup that it's probably gonna depend uh, so what we'd expect to see is that maybe the session C um, step widths or step lengths or something um, might change compared to session A and B. But we might also expect that, um, that it's going to depend on the chicken, right? So different chickens might have different, um, different ways that they walk, basically. Um, and so there's probably going to be a chicken to chicken effect, right? A per chicken effect. And the per chicken effect might be bigger than the session effect. So that's just something for us to consider. So we're going to start by having a look at were session C results different to session A and B results. So our data looks a bit like this. We've got a chicken number. This is chicken number 100. Uh, we've got the session A, B and C. And then we've got a bunch of different measures. Okay, and you can see that we've got multiple. Um, so chicken 100 walked across um, in session A, uh, walked across three times. Okay, and we've got different stride times and different stance times and different step widths and step lengths and so on. Um, and then this stance to stride is a ratio of the of the stance time and the stride time. So it's the stride time divided by the stance time, I think. And then we also have a um, numeric um, identifier here, which is the session within uh, the trial session. So this is... Um, uh, it's essentially, it's a numeric variable that keeps going up as the chicken um, does each walk. So first walk, second walk, third walk, sixth walk, seventh walk, eighth walk across the plate and so on. Okay, so we might try and uh, plot the step width or one of the other measures, but let's try the step width uh, for now in terms of the session. Okay, and because this is a numeric variable, the step width, we're going to use. Uh, we're going to be interested in what the distribution of these things are, and so we're going to be interested in things like the center, the shape, and the spread. So a box plot or a histogram or a density plot will make sense. We'll see all of these as we go. So here's the box plot. All right. So remember the recipe in ggplot. We've specified what data set we have, and then we add on a geometry layer with a mapping. The mapping says what should be on the x-axis and what should be on the y-axis. Step width and session are columns in our data. And so you can see here that, um, that in session A, the step width was on average about 24, right? So that's where the, that's the, the, this is the median here. And that half the data are between the lower quartile and the upper quartile, of, um, which is what the uh, box represents. 
So half of the observations will lie between 21 and about 27 centimetres. But the range of the data is actually quite a bit bigger than that. It goes from about, uh, this is maybe 12, up to about 35. So there's quite a bit of spread um, within session A. So that's of different chickens within session A crossing the, crossing the plate. There's quite a lot of spread. Session B then, um, you can see that the distribution has shifted up a bit, right? So it was centered down here and now it's moved up. The, both the box and the median have moved up. Okay, we get about the same range, about the same spread. Okay, um, but the sh there's a shift in center. And then session C is somewhere between A and B. Okay, um, most similar to B, I guess, but there's not really much difference between B and C and between A and C, really. Now, this is interesting, of course, because session C is the one that should have a difference, right? Session C is the one that they showed, we, we gave the chickens an analgesic. Um, there shouldn't really be a difference between A and B, um, unless maybe the chickens are getting better at walking across the plate or something like that, because session B was done after session A. Um, but if that was the case, then maybe they'd improve again with session C, but they didn't. They actually maybe maybe got worse, but it's, uh, it's much of a muchness. Now I say much for muchness because I've got to be careful here because it only depends on the number, of, so the sort of the accuracy that I can get from of comparing groups on a box plot kind of depends on upon the sample size, right? And I don't have a huge sample size here. I've only got I think it's about 600 observations. I'm not sure did I did we say how many chickens there were? No, I think there's about 600 odd observations, so a couple of hundred per group, which is quite a few. Um, but this isn't a massive difference. So I don't think there's a huge difference here between between the, the different sessions. So my, my first conclusion would be it doesn't seem as though session is making a difference, which implies that the analgesic that probably isn't making a difference as well. And what I'm using to make that call is basically um, comparing the shift in centre with the amount of um, within session variation there is. So I'm looking at the variation between sessions, which will be the shift in centre, with the variation within each session to kind of determine whether there's a change. Now, we'll just pause here. If you've got the slides open, um, you can uh, go through to the slide, they're interactive, and you can um, try and answer this question. Um, how do we tell which of these graphs has a different center? So you have a go at that. Have a guess. What which one do you think has the different center? So I think it's it's the blue one, isn't it? That's the one that yes, I'm right. Okay, if you click and get a red box, then you're wrong. Okay. Um, so this is the one that has the different center. Um, the grey box looks as though it might have a small difference in center. In fact, this has no difference in center at all. So these data were generated completely randomly, such that the center was the same. Uh, these, this one down here, this yellow one, um, this has the same center, but different spread. Okay, you can see that the, the bottom uh, box plot here is a little bit wider than the top one. And the green one, ha again, has the same center and the same spread, but it has a clearly a different shape. Right, if you look at this one here, the median is slightly to the left of the box, and the long tail is out to the right, so that would be skew to the right. Right, it's got more big numbers than it has small numbers. Whereas this, uh, the next one down, the second group here, is skewed to the left because there's a long tail out to the left and the median is bunched up to the right. So most of the data is bunched up to the right and with a long tail to the left, that's skew left. So on stream there'll be a link to this app that you can try out with different random data sets. So you can just get a feel for um, you know, what you would expect box plots to look like, uh, particularly in associated with difference uh, between groups, when things are in, when there are in fact no differences. So there'll always be a plot that has a difference in centre, there'll always be one that has a difference in spread, and there'll be always the one that has a difference in shape, and one where all three things are the same, which is this grey one here. So I, it would be useful, I think, for you to have a play with the um, box plot app uh, on stream, just so you can get a feel for what is normal, what is uh, um, sort of um, something to look out for, and, and what is just something that just happens due to random variation.
Okay. Um, a side note, because we're, um, we've got some code up on these, play, um, these pages, uh, these slides, like this code here, um, when you're coding in our studio, um, copy and paste to your friends, right? Um, generally, I won't ask you to do something um, that you haven't already done, uh, particularly when it comes to um, you know assignment project work uh, down the track. Um, obviously, we will do new things in the labs as we go. So copy and paste the stuff that you've already done before, modify it so that it works for the new situation. Um, use Google to find out um, information about how to find um, you know how to do stuff. Um, supply Google um, useful things such as if you're doing stuff about plots, um, use ggplot in your search term and then just what you want to do. And then of course just assess the Google res um, responses um, as needed. You know, if it's 10 years old then maybe go for something that's a bit newer. Okay, so here's something else we could do with the lane broiler chickens. Instead of a box plot we could use a histogram. So a histogram is a way of again describing a numeric variable. So all I've done is changed um, the geom box plot to geom histogram. Um, I've now made x the step width and I'm colouring in the histogram based on the different sessions. And I'm using 15 bins, 15 bars in the histogram. Um, now this isn't a particularly useful histogram, at least for comparing the sessions, because the green bars start on top of the blue bars, so it's hard to compare the, how the green bars are, are shaped compared to the blue bars because they're on top of each other. Similarly, the red ones are on top of the green ones, so it's hard to compare them. So another way to do the same um, histogram is just to do individual histograms for each session, which we can do by um, using facet wrap to break up the plot into um, different facets um, based on the session variable, right? So this is essentially split the split the data into session A, session B, and session C, and then done a histogram in each one, using the same scales, the same um, bin widths, and, and everything like that. The only thing that differs is the colours, right? Even the same axes. So you notice that the axes are the same, the y-axis is the same, and of course the x-axis is the same as well. So this is probably a better way to compare things. And again, what you see is pretty much the same, right? The, the shape is actually pretty similar between the three. C is a little bit odd in that there's this um, big spike at um, about 25. Okay, that could be something to do with how the, um, like we probably want to play with the bin width a little bit. So change the bins to maybe be 20 and see if that um, remains because it could be an artifact. Um, you know, whenever you divide data up into um, fixed intervals, um, then the border can be a problem, right? So if the if the observations are all sitting right on the border between two two bars, then whether they go left or right um, is quite important to the shape that you that you get, right? So if everything goes left, um, then you'll get a bigger bar on the left than you do on the right, even though all the observations are halfway in between two bins. Um, so it's essentially, the the shapes are probably pretty similar. Um, you can see here that there's a shift up in, um, from A to B, so A centred down here somewhere perhaps, um, and B is, there's a slight move to the right, but it's pretty small, right? It's hard to tell the difference between the between these groups. So my conclusion here would be, really there's not much difference in the sessions. Um, they're all centred at around 25-ish, um, and the spread is all the same, you know, pretty similar across the, across the board from, you know, down, down as low as about 10 and up as high as about 30, 35, 36. Uh, we could also use a density plot. So a density plot is one that you may not have seen before. It's essentially a smooth version of a histogram, right? So you smooth off the, the sort of the steppy nature of the histogram. Um, so that's the, the histogram. And what I've done is I've used alpha um, and I've set it to 0.3 to give it some transparency. So by default, um, each of the groups will just be plotted on top of each other, so they, uh, so, so that they're kind of, um, so you, you would have seen uh, C, but you would have, um, you wouldn't have been able to see the the red bit underneath, underneath the blue one. Um, so the alpha just adds a bit of transparency, so we can see through. And so from this, I can see that um, the distribution of the um, a and B session are pretty similar 
um, but the B session is maybe moved slightly to the right, but only a tiny little bit, there's not really much in it. Um, the C session is a bit more peaked, right, so that um, you've got that kind of bigger spike, if you like, at um, around 25, so 25 is more common um, than in the other um, groups, but again, there's, there's not really a shift in centre. Right, so the average step width, the, the typical step width, if you like, is about the same for all the three groups. So I think I like the box plot best out of these, uh, out of these options. Uh, it's that one there. Or maybe that density. Um, but they all are basically telling the same picture. Okay. So my conclusion would be there doesn't seem to be an effective session, which means there probably isn't an effective analgesic. But... What I do know is that there's many different chickens in this study, um, about 20 odd by the looks, um, 23 maybe, uh, so these are the chickens, and that each of the chickens is responding differently, and I would expect that some chickens would have a bigger step width than other chickens, so for example um, on this line plot here, which is a bit of a mess, we'll see how we can clean that up in a moment, um, you can see that this one down the bottom um, tends so it's probably 107 maybe, is it? Um, chicken 107 tends to have a smaller step width than some of the other chickens, um, such as this blue one tends to be higher. Maybe that's chicken 188, perhaps. But it's hard to see really what's going on because all the chickens are on top of each other. So again, we could use facet wrap to split things out. Okay, so here's a, here's a line graph uh, through time. So X is the trial session, which you remember starts at 1 and goes up to... It goes up by one each time they go across the um, across the plate. Uh, y is the step width, and we're colouring and, and splitting up by chicken. And what you can see is that sure enough, um, some of them are low, like 181, chicken 181 and chicken 175 are sort of consistently low, whereas some of them are consistently high, like chicken 103 and 106. Um, others seem to be improving, chicken 193 maybe. And maybe some have got worse. Uh, let's see. Mm, not too many of them have got worse. Maybe 108. Okay, very slight decreasing trend. Not much in it really, is it? About the same. Um, but a couple of them seem to have got better, so maybe the analgesic's doing something, but perhaps it depends on the chicken. And one of the key points here is that when we're looking at this, um, at this density curve, we're, we're assessing whether there's a difference in the centre between the groups, and we're saying it's not really much of a difference in the context of the range of the step width. Right, so we've got a big range in step widths and it's hard to see the small difference in the average step width. But what we know from looking at, it, at this um, plot over here is that chicken 181 has got a consistently low step width and chicken 103 has a consistently high step width. So the readings over this side might be due to chicken 103 and the readings down here might be consistently due to um, the chickens that are quite low. So a lot of the spread here is due to the chicken. So if we account for the chicken effect, that chickens differ, some of them have small step widths, some of them have large step widths, some of them are in the middle. Once we account for that, it will explain some of the variation in step width which might allow us to see a smaller change in uh, between the sessions. So maybe there is some statistical um, evidence in the data for differences between sessions uh, once we account for the variation that we can explain by knowing um, that, you know, that there's a chicken effect. I don't know. So we sort of um, to sum it up, I mean we can use statistical modelling to do this, we'll, we'll see how we do that later on. Um, overall the idea is we want to assess whether there's difference between sessions and to do so we essentially compare um, how the sessions vary in terms of their centre with how the sessions vary within each other. So how, how you know what's the within session variation, what's the spread within each session. And if there's lots of spread within each session then it's hard to see the difference in terms of the shift in centre because it's small compared to the, the large range that we have. But perhaps by accounting for the between chicken variation we can explain some of the within session variation and that might help us explain, um, help us to see the small differences between sessions and therefore help us conclude that maybe there's an effective analgesic.
Nonetheless, our graphs are showing us that the magnitude of the effect of the analgesic is going to be very small. So if, even if we can show that there is an effect, it's going to be small because if it wasn't small, we would have been able to see it already. Okay. So uh, while we could use a statistical model to sort of tease this apart and maybe be able to say that you know, we can find an effect of the analgesic, the effect of the analgesic is necessarily small because we can't see it in the plots that we've done overall. Okay, So maybe that effect is small enough that it may not have practical importance. So we might be able to find that the analgesic is statistically important but that may be meaningless to us because it's of no practical importance. Okay, there's a difference between those two concepts, right? Okay, uh, so the last example we'll look at is, um, is the same one that we did in the lab, uh, this uh, myofascial trigger points. Um, but the idea here is that we have, um, essentially we give uh, electric shocks um, to uh, the, the, uh, the knot in the muscle um, at a, at a quite a low uh, frequency, so it's a 1 hertz electrical stimulus with a small current. It's enough to make the leg move of the dog. Um, it's not particularly pleasant, I've tried it out myself. Um, uh, and there's some evidence, anecdotal evidence, that um, treating um, animals in this way removes the trigger points from the muscles, and if you remove trigger points from the muscles then perhaps you increase range of movement and so on, and perhaps um, you'll get better performance out of a, out of a dog. Gizmo has a trigger point in his tensor fasciolata muscle. If I press on that spot, he whimpers. I part the hair, apply some denatured alcohol, methylated spirits in Australia. I have the TENS device on intensity 4, sensitivity 0 because that doesn't matter and it's set at 1 hertz. I have my other hand close to the area and I apply the, the TENS probe to that spot. I'm eliciting a twitch response. His whole leg is kicking down to the toes. If I moved my other hand away from the area then I wouldn't elicit that twitch. move the probe slightly to make sure that I maintain the twitch response. And after about 20 seconds of twitching, I gently stretch the leg. Um, so we had a um, 38 racing greyhounds um, in the one or two that were randomly allocated to treatment and controls and the goal was to assess whether the treatment improves things and what we did before we um, started treating them is we randomly allocated to groups and then we counted the number of trigger points that each dog has and you would have seen from the lab that that seemed to produce groups with a different numbers of trigger points. So we did this plot here which again is a stacked histogram um, and you can see here that the blue treatment group um, has a lower number of trigger points than the red group, right? The red group has, um, you know, there's a bunch of, um, in the control group, that has the number of trigger points more than about 16, whereas everyone in the treatment group had fewer than 16 trigger points. <coughs> and we saw that, um, so this wasn't just, a, this isn't just an artifact of the, the way that we've set up the histogram, okay? If we change the number of bins in the histogram, Okay, then we get a sort of a similar 
um, sort of results. Okay, with small data sets, histograms are often not the best way of summarizing them because, you know, in this situation here, we've actually got, only got 19 points in each bin, uh, in each um, group. Um, just like we did with the um, with the chicken data, it's sometimes better to put them um, to use facet wrapping, so to split up the groups into separate uh, subgroups in order to do histograms, so that we so that they're both on the same baseline and we can compare them directly in terms of the shape. And you can see that there is a shift here, and uh, the control group tends to have a larger spread, and is moved up compared to the the treatment group. So the treatment group has fewer trigger points than the control group. So is this a problem for the study, where the control group starts off different to the treatment group? Potentially, right? It's potentially a problem because the treatment um, could potentially, you know, essentially this is telling us that our group is starting off at different numbers of trigger points, and so the treatment could affect the groups differently. And if that's the case, then any difference that we see at the end of the study could just be due to the fact that the groups were different at the start of the study, rather than being due to the due to our our intervention in the study, which was, um, you know, putting them uh, either treating them or not treating them. But of course, this was just all pure randomness. This is just what happens by chance, right? There's nothing going on here that was um, that was um, forcing these counts to be different. They were counted in exactly the same way by the same vet. The vet had no knowledge of which group each dog was in. It just happens to be the way that the random allocation happened. So weird things happen by chance all the time, but nonetheless, the differences here are purely due to randomness. Now, it might make the conclusion from the study a little bit, a little bit harder, um, because we always have to make that argument that, hey, the effect that we see is due to our study, not due to the fact that the two groups were different at the start. But we can do that by just controlling for the number of trigger points that the dogs had at the start. We would, we would probably end up doing that anyway, because there's probably a per dog effect, right? If you start with more trigger points um, as a dog, then, you know, maybe it's easier to, to, to sort of make a big dent in them, to treat quite a few of them and knock down the number of trigger points that you have and therefore your performance might might improve a, gr a great deal whereas if you maybe start off with a fewer fewer trigger points then perhaps the effect on performance is going to be a bit smaller right so our our analysis stage will control for the fact that the group started off slightly differently but the key thing here is that um, is that the the allocation was random so any other differences between the groups, other than just the number of trigger points, any differences, for example, in the gen genetics of, the, of the, the dogs, the age of the dogs, the sex of the dogs, um, is presumably going to be random as well. And so ideally, the groups should be at baseline based on those other characteristics, even if maybe they're not at baseline based on um, the number of trigger points, just by chance. Um, okay, so... Um, Statistics is basically going to give us a way of quantifying how weird things are, right? So this seems to be weird, that just by allocation, essentially all we've done is we've randomly tossed the coin, basically, and, um, you know, we've got, a, we've got a bunch more heads in the control group than we did in the, in the treatment group. And that just happens by chance all the time, right? People win lotto, right? That's a pure chance event. Um, I mean, it's... It's almost certain to happen given the number of um, tickets you buy, but for each person it's purely chance that you win. Nonetheless, it happens all the time. Okay, um, Odd things happen all the time. We've seen that in New Zealand at the moment with COVID, right? We've seen these extremely rare occurrences of infection happen. So, for example, we had the, the, the people um, that were sharing, a, um, essentially shared the, the same airspace in, a, in an elevator um, in MIQ in Christchurch, um, that that's how the infection happened. And the reason we're picking up these super rare things is just because we're, you know, we're, everything is, is, is rare when the numbers are so low, right? Okay, and most of the things we end up doing in statistics is basically just comparing what we see in our data compared to what we'd expect to happen just by chance, right? So if we look at our data and go, oh, wow, that's really odd, I wouldn't expect that to happen then that's giving us a good indication that maybe there's something going on. Whereas if we look at our data and just say, oh, well, that just could have happened, you know, by chance, that's the type of thing that we would expect anyway, just due to sample-to-sample -sample variation, then probably there's nothing going on, right? 
Um, now, there's other other differences between between these groups. For example, if we split them up by male and female, um, then uh, we can see that the number of trigger points is a little bit different. So that the, 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 um, there's only a couple of males with a with a high um, count of trigger point, uh, whereas the females have a, a sort of a flatter distribution. This is kind of hard to tell whether this is actually a thing because you know you're getting there's fairly low counts here. Um, Similarly, if we look at the differences in the control and treatment group, then we can see that they're, they're misbalanced in terms of, of sex. So in the control group, there's, there's more females than males, whereas in the treatment group, there's more males than females. Okay, Again, this is just due to chance, right? They were randomly allocated. There was no you know, trying to allocate more males to the treatment group compared to females or anything like that. It was just purely by chance that this happened. Um, and maybe this is actually explaining what's going on here, right? Um, you know, back here, um, if the treatment group has more males in it, and males tend to have lower number of trigger points, then you'd expect the treatment group to have lower numbers of trigger points just because it's got more males, right? So they, that could be explaining what's going on. Um, we could investigate that by essentially splitting out the data and um, plotting uh, with facet grid, which allows you to split up into small plots based on two variables, one for the rows and one for the columns. So here, um, the rows are tr uh, the different treatments. So we've got the control groups up here, the treatment groups down here, and then the columns are the sex. So here's the females in the control group, the males in the control group, females in the treatment group, and males in the treatment group. And you can see that within each one, that they're actually lower, right? So if you just look at the females, then the control group has higher numbers of trigger points than the than the um, treatment group, and the same same with the males, although it's a little bit less clear there. Right, and you've only got these two dogs with a higher number of trigger points. The other ones are kind of similar. Um, again, this is kind of kind of a bit silly, really, to do a histogram um, here. You've only got, you know, you're only counting sort of. Well, here there's only five dogs, so it's a bit silly to do a histogram based on just five observations. Okay, so uh, we've looked at um, sort of how to see uh, things just using a plot. So when describing a numeric uh, measure, we use centers of spread. Uh, centers of shape and centers of uh, and, uh, measures of center. Um, so measures of center, where is the middle, where is the most typical value, uh, measure of spread, what is the range, minimum to maximum, and measures of shape, so is it skewed to the left or skewed to the right? Are the numbers all bunched up towards one end of the scale and stretched out at the other? Right. When you're looking at groups, you then basically compare that same those same measures across the groups to see whether there's differences. Okay. Uh, differences in center between groups, typically the whole thing moves up, the whole distribution will move up. Um, differences between uh, in spread, your things will stretch out, right? And so um, what does statistics add over just plotting the data? Essentially they're the same thing, right? Plotting the data is statistics. Essentially what you've done is you've applied a statistical summary to the raw data to represent them graphically, right? You've taken the data and reduced them down to a box plot, right? A box plot only shows the minimum, the maximum, the lower quartile, the upper quartile, and the median. So you've summarized the data and then drawn a, drawn a figure based on that. Similarly, the histogram, right? You've split the data into, into, um, into bins and counted the number of observations that fall in each bin. Uh, density plots, you smooth the histogram essentially, right? So you're, you've summarized the raw data down in order to be able to um, say something about the shape of the data. And a statistical model of the data might tell us more. Okay, um, The main thing it does really is allow us to quantify and account for the noise from the sampling process. So when we, when we graph we might see small changes and we kind of have to make a bit of a gut call really about um, whether we think that change is important or not. Um, with a statistical model we can formally um, assess that. Um, as long as the, um, the, the noise from the sampling process is the important part. So as long as we have a sample that is representative of the population, then the noise from the sampling process will tend to be random, and therefore we can accurately gauge how much uncertainty will result from that noise. And then we can say, well, you know, if we, if we see an effect of five units and the uncertainty is, say, three units, then we can we can say there's probably a difference, right? Because the magnitude of the effect is larger than the magnitude of the uncertainty. 
Um, statistical models can obviously, obviously account for features of the data that are hard to separate out in plots. Um, so the obvious one is unit level effects, for example, where you have um, repeat measures of the same uh, unit. So for example, in the chicken one, um, you know, a lot of the variation in the step width was due to the chicken and not due to session. So if we account for the chicken effect, maybe we'll be able to see the session effect. Um, but nonetheless, if an, if an effect is generally important, you'll probably see it on a plot. So if you don't see it on a plot, then you've got a question. Um, first of all, is it, is it really um, of the magnitude such that it's important? Or maybe I just haven't made the right plot yet.